I'm Shyla Dewan, like Nick said. Um, I, I cover criminal justice, but not in New York. So there's a lot I don't know about the way this crazy system works. Um, and we are going to run through a couple of examples tonight, almost as if we were at an actual arraignment. Um, so we can see how bail decisions get made in practice and what kind of information we know when we make those decisions. So we have here Julian Bond O'Connor from the Bronx DA's office. He is going, he's not actually a prosecuting attorney, but he's going to pretend for us tonight. He's the deputy counsel and policy advisor to the district attorney. Uh, we have Robin Marr from the Bronx Defenders, um, a longtime public defender. Um, and Judge Grasso, uh, the supervising judge of New York City arraignments. What is an arraignment? Well, I think they worked it out pretty good earlier. If somebody gets arrested, they don't get a DAT. They get brought in front of a judge where they're formally charged. Jurisdiction is established by the court. In about half of the cases, the case can be disposed of. And then if it's not going to be disposed of at arraignment with a plea, we'll make a bail decision. But I have to, I have to plead guilty or not guilty at the arraignment, right? Absolutely. Unless, you know, if you take a disposition, you're going to plead guilty. Otherwise, you're going to plead not guilty, and we'll go forward from there. And then if we don't dispose of the case in addition to making a bail decision, we'll make an adjournment date if it's going to be for trial, if it's going to be for motion practice, something like that. All right. So um, I'm, going to, I'm going to read to you guys um, the hypotheticals that we have here. And I really like these cases, actually, because I think that as – as journalists, often we commit the sin of oversimplification. Um, the criminal justice system is really, really complicated. And especially if, like me, you go from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, each one has its own quirks and ins and outs. And a lot of times when we're covering this stuff in the media, we, we some, partly by necessity, we have to sort of elide and gloss over some of the complexities. So these are some really great, complicated stories. So the first one is John Doe, um, who is charged with a Class B felony. And the criminal complaint is that police officer Rivera states that on or about May 10th, 2016, at approximately 6.30 p.m., at the corner of 149th Street and 3rd Avenue in the Bronx, the defendant did commit the offense of criminal sale of a controlled substance in the third degree in that the defendant did knowingly and unlawfully sell a narcotic drug. Police officer Rivera is informed by an undercover police officer that at the above time and place, so in other words, the undercover officer that actually saw the defendant do this is not there at the arraignment. He has told this to another officer. Mm -hmm. The undercover officer and defendant did engage in a drug-related conversation after which the defendant poured a liquid substance into an empty Poland Springs bottle in exchange for a sum of United States pre-recorded by money based on the undercover police officer's training experience, which includes training in the recognition of controlled substances and their packaging. The aforementioned substance is alleged and believed to be methadone. So, what do we know about John Doe at this point? We know that he has a total of 16 past arrests. He has 12 misdemeanor convictions for misdemeanor drug possession, trespass, and pettit larceny. He has no prior felony convictions and no prior warrants for failure to appear, which means he's never had a court date where he didn't show up. His most recent misdemeanor, a drug possession conviction, is from 2010, so six years before. He completed the task drug treatment program and was sentenced to a misdemeanor and a conditional discharge. According to his rap sheet, he has not been arrested since 2010. And according to his interview with the Criminal Justice Agency, Mr. Doe is 38 years old. He lives alone in supportive housing at the Brook residence on East 148th Street in the Bronx. He has lived there for two years. The Criminal Justice Agency lists a cell phone number, but no contacts are provided to verify this information. He is currently unemployed, but attends a daily methadone program in the Bronx, and he is deemed a moderate risk for failure to appear. Mr. O'Connor. All right, uh, speaking on behalf of the Office of 
Bronx District Attorney. I can tell you that as a district attorney, a young assistant is usually handling a case like this. Um, in my mind, the first thing you want to do is kind of picture from the facts, what do you believe is happening in this case? Uh, an assistant will usually be looking through what will be a case summary that was prepared by someone. And in determining what they're going to do at arraignment, you know, there's pretty much a three-pronged attack where they're going to look at what CJA is recommending, uh, performing some sort of analysis of the, of the rap sheet, and uh, really looking at the strengths of the case. So if you start with those th three prongs, you, you would then work from there. Um, so you look at the strength of the case by determining, okay, what, 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 what kind of case do we really have here? Is this um, a recovering addict who's coming out of the methadone clinic and some undercover is, you know, well, you know, disguised discreetly and says, look, man, I, I just need something. Give me one and I'll give you 10, right? And this guy ends up getting arrested later on, right? So you're like, mm, is this one of those situations? This is not, you know, the crime of the <laughs> century. Um, so, and then when you evaluate the strength of the case, you might think of things like, okay, well, with this ca case, do we have pre-recorded buy money? Do we have, do we have the cash? Do we have any additional stash? Do we have any other indicators that this person is really a seller as opposed to just a user, right? So that's the first analysis that you're going to make on the strength of the case. What is pre-recorded buy money? Pre-recorded buy money is uh, undercovers go out in order to buy drugs. They got to have some money in order to know that this is the money that they spend. They write down the serials numbers that are on the bills. So they call it pre-recorded buy money because they recorded the serials on it. And if they arrest the defendant and they find the money that matches the serial that the officer had, you know, it, it strengthens the case. So that would be the first prong in identifying the strength of the case. But for all intents and purposes here, it looks like this is someone who is a recovering addict. Um, then you look at what CJA is recommended. And here, they say he's a moderate fret, uh, risk. Um, they do so based on the fact that he has an established criminal history. Um, and uh, there's really no one, as it seems, that's going to be able to, you know, vouch for him to, to, to make bail. Um, you know, there's no family present in this hypothetical. Um, so CJ is saying mm, he's a moderate risk. But he's been arrested so many times and he's never failed to appear before. Yes. Doesn't that count? That's right. <laughs> you're, you're absolutely I'm sorry, correct. sorry, am I stepping on your toes? Um, but that is what CJA has written. That is not necessarily what people are going to rely on in making their uh, determination, but it's a factor worth considering. And uh, the last part of it is looking at his, his rap sheet, as you pointed out, by saying that you know, he has all of these arrests. So in this case, ultimately, the people have been tasked by the state of New York to determine what bail is um, appropriate in this matter. And, you know, if someone said, you know, I'm going to I'm going to ask for five thousand dollars bail, you would lose all credibility that night with the judge because this that is, would be high. Absolutely, because this is not the kind of case that, you know, would require some extraordinary amount of bail, especially for a person who is, by all means, indigent and a recovering addict. But given that this is the first time that the person is, uh, you know, looking at a felony uh, where the result in this case is either going to be, you know, thinking ahead, either probation some sort of alternative to tr uh, treatment program, or it's going to be, you know, jail. And the jail is going to be, you know, it's go it would be low jail, but it could be a year or two if, you know, if those other options weren't available. What's the maximum penalty for a, a buy and bust like this? Uh, I think... Uh, and Penal loss, 220.39 parentheses one. I'll, I'll, re I'll rely yes. on both counsel here. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. 12 is the maximum, is but a person like this would be eligible for non-incarceratory. He wouldn't right. be looking anywhere near that. Yeah. Right. I mean, I mean, truth be told, the most he would be looking at is like one to two, if 
tops. Right. And uh, and probation would be likely. You mean one to two years. Years. But even though he can't get two years. Maximum is 12 months, you said? No. No, no, no years. Months. He can get well, many, many years, years. but this is yeah. maximum he felony. could get. Yeah. yeah. Okay, is, thank right. you. Sorry, I thought you meant yeah. 12 months. Yeah. So, so given that, uh, an assistant is going to, uh, given the risk that is present where this person is, is going to be looking at some time that they're probably uh, would be new, a younger assistant would probably say, I'm just going to ask for $1,000 bail. And I think that in this particular set of facts, that would probably be the appropriate request. Defense. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so before I get into defending my client and advocating for my client, By the Mr. Way, how Doe. How long ago did you meet your client? Um, apparently 60 seconds ago. I think that's mm -hmm. the going. How, how I mean, and it, I, want, I want to say, I think, you know, sort of relevant to that conversation, it's true that the amount of time that we have to speak to our clients before we have to go before the judge and advocate for our clients, advocate for their liberties, actually is very constrained. So there's a lot of information going back and forth, information that we're reading in the court paperwork, information that we're giving to our clients, information that we're getting from our clients. Um, so it's true, it's a very sort of fa fast-paced situation. Um, but before I turn to Mr. Doe, I just want to say, that I'm very happy to be here. I'm very happy to be participating in this conversation today. I think that there are a lot of ideas and innovation out there um, around the question of how to fix our broken bail system. Um, I think there are a lot of very creative ideas, very well-intentioned initiatives and programs, but I want to say first and foremost that I think that the fix in a lot of ways is actually pretty simple. Um, the fix is that judges need to follow the bail law more closely. Um, as we heard, New York law is clear that uh, bail should only be set if necessary and in an amount and form necessary to ensure that somebody comes back to court. And the judge is supposed to consider the person's, the case before them, the person before them, their history, their background, their community ties, uh, their financial circumstances. And I think if that's what actually happened on a day-to-day -day basis in arraignment court, uh, the population of people who are languishing at Rikers Island on bail that they can't afford would decrease significantly. So and I think that is actually a good segue to Mr. Doe, somebody who um, I think that the DA's office would be likely to ask for, as, as we said before, $1,000, maybe even a little more than that for Mr. Doe. Um, but if we actually look at what the bail law wants, what the bail law requires judges to do, uh, the right outcome for Mr. Doe is that he be released on his own recognizance. And there's a bunch of reasons for that. First of all, we can look at the facts of this particular case. So this is a sting operation, a case where um, undercover police officers are standing outside of a methadone clinic, often pretending to be sort of dope sick addicts and begging people coming out of their program, hey, can you help me out, can you help me out? Um, and then suddenly somebody finds himself arrested and slapped with a felony, B felony drug sale charge. Um, and you know, this is technically, according to the penal law, a felony drug sale. This is probably not what most of us think about when we think about drug sellers or drug traffickers, but that is the reality of uh, the war on drugs in New York City. So sort of bracketing the question of policing and, and over-policing, um, I think another important factor for Mr. for Mr. Doe is that he doesn't have any felony convictions. He's eligible, as I mentioned before, for non-incarceratory sentences, for probation. Even if he were convicted of the most serious charge in this, in this case, he would be eligible for a sentence of time served. So there's no, no reason that Mr. Doe would flee uh, the jurisdiction or not come back to court. Another very important factor that was mentioned before is the fact that Mr. Doe has, despite having prior contacts with the criminal justice system, he has never failed to come to court when he was supposed to show up. He has no warrant history and that fact by itself should militate in favor of him being released on his own recognizance. Um, another factor is the fact that he, his last contact with the criminal justice system was six years ago at a time when he probably had a lot less stability in his life. And what we know about his life right now is that he does have strong community ties, that he is in a supportive housing program um, where he probably has a social worker um, and access to other services. He's attending a drug treatment program, as we know. Um, so 
you know, we also know that he has a working phone number, he has a way to be contacted, so he has all these sources of support in his life and reasons <laughs> to think that uh, he's sort of grounded in the community and that he would come back to court. Um, another piece of the bail statute is the requirement that the court consider a person's ability to pay. And I think that's a really important factor in Mr. Doe's case. We know that he's not working. Uh, we know that he's living in supportive housing, which means that he may have some sort of health issue, a mental health issue, or a disability. So he's probably living on a pretty limited fixed income. Would you say $10? He can use the $10 and pre-recorded? The pre-recorded buy money, right, yeah. No, that's, that, that will be confiscated by the police. What, what would happen um, is that, you know, he's the kind of person who, for whom $500 is, is going to mean that he's going to sit at Rikers Island until his case is completed. Um, he is not somebody who uh, has access to $500 cash. He's not somebody who has access to the money to pay the fees of an insurance company bail bondsman. He's probably not even somebody who can use any of the other alternative forms of bail that we heard about um, that involve credit cards or sureties. Um, and so the setting of bail in his case will mean that he goes to Rikers Island. And for somebody like Mr. Doe, going to Rikers Island will be devastating to him. Um, he will probably lose his connection to the services that he has in the community. He may lose his spot at his supportive housing program. Uh, it's often very difficult to get beds or spots at these, at these programs. And if he's at Rikers, it's going to go to someone else and he's going to have to get in the back of the line to reapply. Um, he's going to obviously not be connected to his drug treatment program while he's at Rikers. Um, and so if he, if he ends up going to jail on this case for any amount of time, whether it's a couple days or a couple months or longer, he's going to return to the community and he's going to have less stability in his life than when he first went in. So for all of these reasons, Judge, I'm asking you to release Mr. Doe on his own recognizance. I, I would just note for the record, in, in a real live court appearance, there's no way that application would have been even given that amount of time. Right. Like, like, let's let's be clear. If it's one to two minutes, you would have been interrupted and the judge would say, all right, I get it. I know, counsel, this is not the first time I've had one of these cases. Right? Well, actually, that's not true. And Robin will tell you, I rarely, if ever, interrupt a defense attorney's application. Uh, if it goes on and on and on and it starts getting repetitive, I will say, let's try not to repeat ourselves. But just speaking for myself. Uh, Hearing all of this, it's a pretty easy decision. Remand. <laughs> in all seriousness, frankly, this to me isn't really a very complicated case. This is an ROR. And, 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 what's dry, and, and I think the DA was even struggling to come up with $1,000. Uh, and, and the reason why it's not that complicated is because, you know, you've got six years, the person hasn't had any contacts, and then prior to that, the person had numerous contacts with the system, but made every court appearance, and now here you're in front, he's in front of you on a, the judge on a, on a uh, nonviolent felony. So I would ROI this. Yeah, you're going to let him go. This guy has been arrested. I mean, 16 times. He's 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 clearly a menace. If you're the if you're, Society, I mean, if you're the DA, if you're the DA, say, if you're the DA saying that, now I'll say, let's move on. <laughs> That, 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 that I will, let's move on. Next case, please. Were, were, you, were you convinced at all? Did I, by, by, by Robin's argument? Did you, uh, would you back down? And the, she doesn't have to convince. I, I used to work with Bronx Defenders. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a former defense attorney. <laughs> It, you know, the you deck know, is you know, stacked you know, here. Actually, convinced me. <laughs> no, this was this was not yeah. a hard this was not a hard decision at no. all. This circumstance. Can, can I just say to one me thing? anyway? Okay. One thing I think that I, I could see a judge listening to the arguments of the prosecutor, listening to my arguments, and looking at Mr. Doe's criminal record and thinking, well, maybe this is a this is a case where a supervised release program should come in, since you know it seems like he has some drug issues, and this is a B, a B felony, so it's a, it's a serious case. Um, and, you know, I would, I would... So that would mean he would get out, but he, he would need to report. Right. He would have reporting he might have requirements. He have to go somewhere to report. He might have to 
take drug tests. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I, I could no, see. No, supervised Joe release case. Not the, the way we've set up supervised release since March 1st, he would not be required to take drug. What, what he would have to do is what we call a mandatory needs assessment. He'd have to cooperate with that, see if there is any underlying substance issues, housing issues. They'll go over the medical insurance. But services would not be mandated at that point. Drug testing would not be mandated at that point as part as as part of the um, supervised release program that we have in place now. But I would not consider this case personally for supervised release, and here's why. We are supposed to reserve our thought process for supervised release cases to those cases that we would not otherwise deem appropriate for release on recognizance. And if I'm looking at the rap sheet in this case, and I'm zoning in on the fact that it's six years without any contact. And furthermore, with all of his, all the that contacts. You would weigh that pretty heavily. So. I, would weigh that, I weigh that, would weigh that extremely heavily. And the fact that the person is never warranted. So I, supervised release is not supposed to be in lieu, and this is a very important point to, for people to understand supervised release. It's not supposed to be in lieu of ROR cases. It's supposed to be another layer above and beyond ROR cases. So speaking for myself, I would not be zoning in on this as supervisor. All right, um, so we're, we, we're actually, we're, since we're running over time, we're gonna um, just do the one case, unfortunately, because Jane Doe We should do the second case. Was even case. more. The second case, you know, we're gonna miss out on the second case, because the second case, if you want me to, because I read through it, Okay. That's a that's a supervised okay, release case. Okay, she's gonna let us do the second case. <laughs> Thank you, Andrea. All right, then I'll go. I'll, I'll go quickly. I'm sorry. Why did you say? What, what were you saying? Well, if you're gonna do it, I'll save my I'll okay, save, save my decision you. until I hear okay. the record. All right, the council council <laughs> gonna have to. I'll keep it. I'll keep well, it. Have sixty seconds. You're talking about this time. Yeah. All right. So we have Jane Doe. Um, she uh, did steal property with intent to benefit herself or a person other than the owner thereof. Um, the police officer is informed by John Ortiz, a loss prevention officer, that at a commercial establishment, the Rite Aid Pharmacy, he observed defendant remove eight boxes of Similac baby formula and place them inside a bag she was carrying. She then walked past the cash registers and out of said lo location without paying. Defendant then stated in sum and substance, it's for my baby, I don't have money. Officer Rivera is informed that the value of said property is approximately $198 and blah, blah. Okay. Um, Jane Doe has a total of 10 past arrests. She has a five misdemeanor convictions for drug possession, trespass, and pettit larceny. She has one felony. And this is a pettit larceny case. I guess that's what we call shoplifting. Um, she has one felony conviction on her record from 2007 where she pled guilty to a drug sale and got probation, which she did not complete. She violated probation. Um, and she was resentenced to nine months in jail. On her misdemeanor cases, she has four prior failures to appear. She had an open bench warrant for failure to complete two days of community service. She pled guilty on December 20th, 2015 to a pettit larceny and got a sentence of two days of community service, but did not complete any community service. She is 28 years old. She lists her, her mother's address on West 198th Street. She does not appear to live there consistently. Criminal Justice Agency lists a cell phone number, but no contacts are provided to verify her information. She is not working. CJA deems her a high risk of failure to appear, and she's not recommended for release, given her past warrant history and current bench warrant at arraignments. During the arraignment interview, Ms. Doe gives her defense attorney her boyfriend's phone number. He comes and verifies that Ms. Doe does indeed have a six-month-old baby. Uh, this, people. Yes. Uh, this hypothetical was designed for everyone's heart to bleed for someone who, you know... It's clearly a terrible menace to society. Actually. It's not menace. Yeah. It's just that, you know, she Ten. stole... Similac to feed her baby. So it pulls on the heartstrings. Why can't she but, just get a job? Well, I don't, I don't even think that's, uh, you know, I don't think that's necessarily the issue here. I think it's, uh, 
the factors that would be relevant to the the young assistant would be uh, her criminal history um, and and her her warrant history and the fact that she's violated probation and the fact that CJA already recommends that she's a high risk. And I mean, even if you're a defense attorney, you know, this is a high risk client for uh, for actually coming back to court. And on the defense side, someone would struggle with, OK, realistically, how much jail time is this person going to get? Is it going to be a short amount of jail time where the case will be over and she won't have to deal with the court system and come back? Or is this going to be a situation where you're really going to fight this case for over or a year or two for this to, to sort itself out? Or should this person take a plea today? And so in my mind, this, this case is not necessarily about bail. Uh, primarily, this case would be getting pled at arraignments and, uh, you know, Obviously, our panel would uh, may think differently, but I, I think this case is getting resolved at arraignment with a few days jail. I don't I don't see this as a matter where the discussion of bail is going to be, you know, the strong suit here. What is she facing here? It's a misdemeanor. It's a, so it's a misdemeanor. A so it's potentially a year in jail. And so what's well, your offer going to be? Oh, well, let's say the people, the people are, they're making an offer, but if they're pleading to the top charge, which is just going to be a misdemeanor, the judge can, you know, can decide what he or she wants to give as a sentence. So the people, you know, it's kind of like a negotiation. The people could say uh, 20 days. Right. And the fence could say five. Let's say, for example, the person has been in a total of two and where they may only have to serve one more. And client might might want to take that so I think and so let's say she doesn't want to take it what's your what's your um, bail recommendation bail recommendation is like five hundred dollars you know defense well I think I think the point that was made about the coercive nature of that situation the fact that that if she doesn't take a plea right then and there um, to something like three days um, she's going to end up with bail set on her and then have to stay in Rikers Island for the next week until she comes back to court and maybe gets a different plea bargain offer from a judge. Um, I think, you know, what happens if she so in ends, other words, it's better for her to plea because well, I mean, less time. That's a decision for her to make. I think the reality of the situation is that, um, you know, she ought to be released on her own recognizance. She is somebody who has family members in the audience. She is somebody who has a young child. She's sort of in a different place in her life now than she was before. I, I know that there's, in the fact pattern, she has a warrant for not doing community service, um, but that warrant was issued, I think, five months ago, and she has a six-month um, child. So, you know, th whether sh she should have been uh, mandated to do community service when she was either nine months pregnant or, you know, had a one-month-old, um, I, th I think, you know, the question of whether this is the kind of person who should be sitting at Rikers Island on $500 bail is kind of central to what we're talking about today. She's somebody who obviously has limited finances. Um, <coughs> look at the nature of the charges, we can see that it's a nonviolent misdemeanor charge. But she's probably not coming back. I mean, look at her. She does, she's got four prior failures. So. Well, I mean, I, I would argue that what's going on in her life right now with her boyfriend actually coming to court with the fact that she does have this young child. Um, and, you know, if, if bail is set, if that's something that the judge is thinking about in this case, um, this may be a client who I make a referral to a charitable bail fund for. Um, I, I, I want to make a point, though, if I, if I could just finish. At some point. <laughs> 30 seconds, counsel. So, <laughs> I, I, you know, what I want to say is that, is that this, the done. idea of haggling over 20 days or three days or 10 days, you know, she'll end up at Rikers Island, a place that is not known to cure poverty, but, uh, which I believe is the reason that this case exists in, in the first place. I think, you know, if I had to prescribe a bail reform sort of solution for Ms. Doe, I would say she should be sentenced to six months of free baby formula, and that would probably get at the root of this crime. No, that's, so that's that, that's that's the one piece where I disagree here because the what needs the problem that needs to be addressed is this is a person in need of certain social services, and if we're going to try to do that 
while we have a case pending and bringing this person back and forth to court just to meet those social services, I don't think that meets the, that particular client's need either. So dragging out this case where we're not dealing with actual innocence, we're dealing with someone who did do it, right? Um, or at least allegedly in this case, because it's a hypo. But the idea of providing the individual services is the greater need. Now, can you do that after the person gets out or while that case is pending? That's, that's the weird balance here. And that's the reason why I, I, I just don't know if, you know, the whole idea about getting this person bail and getting the case over with, sometimes it may be that you say, well, you know, as soon as you come out, come to my office and we can help you with social services. But again, that's just an alternative. So at this, point, at this point in time, I would be saying, will the councils please stop with their conversation so I can make a decision? We've got a lot of other people in the audience waiting to be heard. So I'm in a great position to handle this case tonight because we've got the whole Bronx Community Solutions team here. So I'm thinking Bronx Community Solutions on this case in all seriousness, and I'm going one of two ways in this case. And I'm starting, she's not going to jail in front of me, for starters. So if we're going to take a plea, something we have in the Bronx, which is a great program, is, and we don't have it in all boroughs, is we have social services, we have individual counseling. So I would be looking to see if the prosecutor would be interested in a violation, like a disorderly conduct with a jail alternative, one day individual counseling, two days social services, and we could take the plea right there. And then I would send her right into the Bronx Community Solutions office. They, she'd make an appointment. They'd do the one-on-one -on -one session. They'd see what was going on with her life. You know, what, what her medical situation is, what her job situation is, what her housing situation is, they could put her on a good track. But she might not want to take a plea for a lot of reasons. You know, maybe she feels that she's already got too much of a record and she's going to get beat up. It could maybe hurt her with some kind of services. You know, maybe there's immigration consequences. So there may be a whole variety of reasons we won't go the plea route. Then what I'm going to say to Robin, after Robin has made a vociferous argument that I should ROR, I'm going to say, Robin, have you spoken to anyone from the supervised release program? And Robin would probably say to me at that point, yes, I have, because she would have set it up to have that as a backup if I wasn't going to go ROR. Because one of the important things of the supervised release program is it is defense driven. Uh, a person can only be considered by supervised release if defense counsel is permitted the supervised release, which in the Bronx would be Bronx Community Solutions, to have a representative interview the defendant. And then I'm thinking supervised release. Now, and this is, this is why I wanted to do this hypothetical, because it's a great opportunity for people to wrap their heads around what supervised release means. On the felony, a B felony, where someone could have looked at up to 12 years in jail, theoretically, it was pointed out, I wasn't considering supervised release. On the misdemeanor, where the max is a year in jail, I consider it to be a textbook case for supervised release. Why? Because in the felony, when I look at it objectively, I don't have an objective reason to believe this person is not a good bet to come back to court. This would be an ROR the way I would usually do business, so I'm not doing it. But with this woman, as heartbreaking as the circumstance is, she is a terrible bet, in my opinion, all things being equal to come back to court. She's in front of me with an active warrant that I just vacated. She has multiple previous warrants. She's got a previous uh, violation of probation. And would supervised release connect her to services? Uh, well, here's the thing. So what we do with supervised release, we have a contract. We sign the contract in court. I speak to the defendant about the contract. They're going to do a risk assessment. They're going to do an. We will give you baby formula. No. What the contract says they will do is they will do a mandatory needs assessment. In the mandatory needs assessment, I'll bet you that the social work is over in Bronx Community Solutions will find a way for her to find a legal way to get baby formula instead of going in and stealing cases worth $200. And All right, that's where the needs assessment is important. I'm getting apoplectic gestures from behind okay. you. Okay. Well, I, I hope we've been helpful. That's the thought process. <laughs>